Well, Carrie, we get ready to head into week five and week four. Um, had some surprises. Some other scores weren't so surprising. Um, obviously, we got to see uh, the revitalization, the Galena Stockton uh, rivalry, where Galena pulled out that game in a 14 to 6 win. Uh, the Dupac Orangeville game did not go as anticipated, with uh, Dupac pouring on 47 first half points in the rain with their passing offense to uh, take over Orangeville 47 to 20. Aquin and East Dubuque had a good fight in the first half, which has become the norm for East Dubuque this year, but Aquin obviously pulled away in the second half to that 40 to 12 win, and Aquin has shown that they are very much a tough second half team. Um, Forreston took care of Rockford Christian 48 to 23, but not surprised to see Rockford Christian put up 23 points once again, although a lot of that was after Forreston was already up uh, big on in that one. And Milledgeville EPC was a 22 to 12 game uh, for Milledgeville, so the Missiles keep scrapping out victory after victory. And Amboy pulled out a 16 to 8 win over West Carroll. That was pretty much scoreless all game long. Uh, before, you know, 24 points got thrown on the board in the fourth quarter. So uh, pretty cool. Big stack games out of Hunter Hoffman, Jordan Neuschwander, Will Gustafson, and Ty Stiekel once again for Aquin. Matt Nebdahl had a big game for Dupec. Hayden Newendorf had an awesome game for Aquin. Uh, Trent Harris played big for Dupec. And Damon Miller was all over the field once again for Milledgeville in that uh, game as well. So um, a lot of big uh, games, big plays, and uh, big stats this past week. Yeah, it was unfortunate that Lena Winslow and Dakota didn't get to play, but hopefully, you know, Dakota gets better and we'll see what Lena brings uh, in their, Lena Winslow brings in their matchup versus Galena. Sweet. You're right, exactly, and it is a bummer because now it affects Orangeville, who's going to go play at Knoxville this week, which we're going to break down that game a little bit here coming up, and obviously it leaves Stockton wide open for week six, so Stockton's still looking for an opponent, and I know talking to Coach Lightson, he is... He wants to play whoever's available, so um, it'll be interesting. Hopefully something does come out for them to have an opponent in week six because Nobody wants to see a team not play that's available to play. And like you said, it's unfortunate for Lena Winslow. So last minute things happen, unfortunately. But speaking of Lena Winslow, they get a bounce back this week with a big game in our NUIC game of the week against Galena. Uh, putting together a, a once big game that we used to look forward to quite a bit in the bat past years. Um, and here it is at the forefront again. So... It'll be interesting to break these games down, and we'll get that started right now. Well, our crossover matchup this week takes us over to Auburn High School, and the game will be played at 11 a.m. on Saturday, and it will feature the EPC Wildcats taking on the Duke Peck Rivermen. Yeah, it should be a good game, uh, hopefully. Obviously, EPC comes in with a 2-2 two and two mark after losing the Milledgeville 22-12 this past week. Dupec comes in at a 3-1 mark, rolling off three straight victories after they took care of Orangeville 47-20. Last year, this was a back-and-forth game that Dupec won 36-34 in Week 2. This is really going to be an interesting matchup, I think. Um, EPC had a really tough time covering the pass in Week 1 against Alina. Obviously, Hunter Hoffman, like you said, he comes in with big numbers, especially off of last week alone. How does Galena contain Hunter Hoffman? Uh, well, the first thing that you have to do is you have to get pressure onto Hoffman and, you know, force him to make plays. Obviously, we've noticed that Dupec is still having troubles running the ball. Um, even late in the game against Orangeville, up big, Despite the conditions, it was still hard for them to get the ball moving on the ground. With that, the EPC defensive line has to be able to win that line battle and make Hunter uncomfortable. One of the biggest problems with that, though, is Hunter has really progressed this year in how he feels the opponents around him, and he's been able to get himself into different situations or out of different situations by keeping his feet moving, 
keeping his eyes downfield, and he's just picked up that knack of presence of where the pressure's coming from. So he's not taking on big hits, and he's able to create the possibility to still get the pass off while uh, looking down the field at the same time. Dupet keeps improving week to week. Um, EPC is known for their strong line. How does Dupec swing that so that they can balance? Yeah, I think on the defensive side, like we just stated, you got to be able to get pressure. You have to win that line battle and get that pressure on Hoffman. Um, because I think as far as a defensive run game, EPC can be very formidable against Dupec. As far as a pass game, I'm more concerned there because, um, as we stated, uh, Hoffman's able to uh, elude a lot of pressure and be able to get the passes off. And there hasn't really been a team that's been able to keep up with that thus far um, outside of Aqua. With that, on the offensive side for EPC, they have to be able to get the run game going. Um, obviously, with Logan Krell in the backfield, they're able to do some things. But here over the past couple weeks, it's been Kellen Henze on a lot of option plays that, have, that has really kept some drives alive uh, from his quarterback position. So. They have to be able to, again, get those blocks in place, give Krell some room to run. They have to be able to uh, play effectively and not create turnovers because the Dupac defensive line has been very tough. Um, Breon Green is only a sophomore. He has stood out big time uh, for the Rivermen. Uh, here of late. Obviously, last week, Trent Harris stepped up big. Jake Anderson was out of the game last week, but in the previous games, he has stepped up. So you got to be able to control that. And, uh, you know, as long as you can um, keep them at a distance and get that run game going, you're going to have success. But you have to grind it out because in the defensive backfield, Dupac's tough. Who are you taking? I like the Riverman in this game uh, for a lot of reasons. On turf for is one of the biggest reasons. Utilize that team speed. I agree. I also have the Riverman this week. Our North matchup of the week takes us over to East Dubuque High School, 7 p.m. on Friday night. Uh, that game will feature the Stockton Blackhawks taking on the East Dubuque Warriors. Yeah, uh, Kara, both teams come in with a 1-3 and three record last week. Stockton lost to Galena 14 to 6, and East Dubuque lost to Aquin 40 to 12. Last year, Stockton won this game 50 to 6 in Week 8, but I'm expecting a much different game this time around between these two teams. Definitely, um, both teams have. You know, I know you always talk year in and year out about the NUIC gauntlet. It's a little different this year given COVID, but East Dubuque has played Aquin and Lena Winslow, and Stockton has played Dupec in Galena. Um, so that makes, obviously, an interesting matchup to begin with. Um, what does Stockton need to do to control the ball and the game this week? Well, you know, Stockton's got to be able to um, get Herman going early and often. Uh, at the same time, they need to be able to utilize uh, Andrew Hess and um, Hunter Hilly. Um, obviously, one of the issues with Stockton right now is they have a run game, inconsistent line play, and turnovers are their Achilles heels at the moment. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of their turnovers are via the interception. And if you get your run game shut down, you have to be able to throw the ball and Stockton has not been able to be effective at throwing the ball at this point in the season. Um, granted, you can't totally go away from it either. It's just it's something that Stockton needs to keep working on to keep developing uh, in order to give themselves a chance. But again, it's got to come down to consistent line play. Don't have the stupid penalties. You can't get caught for holding. You got to be able to play clean. Make the holes happen, and again, like I said, just you got to get that backfield going because you have the horses there. You got to get it moving. Um, a little bit more speed up front would help that off the line. Get that first initial push into the uh, defensive line. 
And I think that's going to be a little bit of a tough chore after what I saw out of East Dubuque last week. East Dubuque has to make adjustments because they've faced some injury problems. How did they respond this week to the Stockton? Well, you know, unfortunately, we saw Sam Bowman uh, go out, and he's already announced on Twitter that he's done for the season, which is unfortunate. Hopefully, you know, he comes back uh, ready to go, and it sounds like he'll be ready to go for fall. Uh, which is a positive sign. So with that, you know, when he left the game, they moved Dawson Fye into the quarterback position. Um, they utilized him in more of a like a wildcat deal because he is one of their running backs. Um, pretty explosive. He had some electrifying plays uh, against Aquin, actually scored the two touchdowns that they had. But it is going to limit what they can do as far as passing the ball. Um so what they need to do is they're going to have to, you know, come up with a plan to um, get Huntington and Fine going together, kind of on a QB option type deal. You know, they like to uh, spread it out. So they're kind of similar to what Aquin does as far as running that spread offense. And, and, and they're just going to have to play a little bit of misdirection football and maybe get some short passes or some quick slants that Fine can hit. Uh, to keep the defense uh, respectful. Um, on the defensive side of the ball, you know, East Dubuque had some good plays. Um, really stepping out where Ben Tressel and Gabe Hill be up front. And that's where I think that Stockton's going to have a problem. Those two guys created a lot of chaos for Aquin in the first half of that game. And uh, as long as they can keep up that type of play, they're going to disrupt what Stockton wants to try to do in their trap game. So like I said earlier, you know, they've both faced really good opponents this season so far. Um, I don't know about you, just looking at all the numbers, I'm going to take East Dubuque. Who do you have? Yeah, I'm flipping my pick to East Dubuque as well. I originally had Stockton, but the Warriors really stood out last week, and I think they can turn it around this week. So what was supposed to be... Another North matchup this week has turned into, I don't know, a three-hour or so drive. I don't know. It depends on how fast Kyle's driving, I guess. Um, but we will see the Orangeville Broncos taking the field against the Knoxville Blue Bullets. All right. Um, and that'll be down at Knoxville High School, 7 p.m. on Friday. Yeah, better get that bus warmed up and get ready for a long haul because... The Broncos are hitting the road. Um, obviously, Orangeville comes in with a 1-3 and three mark. Knoxville comes in with a 2-2 two and two mark. Last week, Orangeville lost to Dupac 47-20, and Knoxville beat Macomb 38-0. Um, you know, Knoxville is one of those teams that plays in the Prairie Land Conference. Um, the Prairie Land Conference historically has not been a typically tough conference. You see a lot of their teams that have had success in recent years tend to fall out by the first or second round of the playoffs. So they're not a conference that is with a lot of power behind it. Um, obviously, we've seen them most recently with Abingdon Avon and with Lewistown, uh, teams that we've seen recently in the playoffs here uh, with Milledgeville and Lena Winslow. So The Broncos have played tough all year, but have failed at protecting the football and not defending the deep ball. How can the Broncos regroup and pull out a W in Week 5? Uh, well, obviously, you know, Orangeville has some things that they got to work on. Offensively, their line has done a pretty decent job uh, being able to make some holes. Um, uh, Kay Janicki has been their workhorse and a stud at that even despite the lopsided loss he still ran for 131 yards on 22 attempts with three touchdowns uh last week in the rain so um obviously you got to keep feeding your horse um but at the same token you know you got to you got to get other guys involved and right now Orangeville has an, an issue passing the ball um they have not been very effective going in the air so they have to be able to rely on more misdirection. Unfortunately, um, they did run into a little bit of an injury bug on uh, Saturday that took one of their running backs out of the game um, with Carson Rote. Hopefully he's going to be fine, be able to come back. 
uh, this week. Um, but, I mean, that definitely took another option away, and Orangeville's one of those teams. You can't take away those options. Knoxville, they're a heavy rush team. How does Orangeville negate the rush? Well, you know, Knoxville's going to come out in a double wing. They're going to run wing T, and they're going to run the I formation. Um, one of the – they're – Two of the backs that they really got a key on are Peyton Hankins and Lane Grice. Um, outside of that, uh, they will try to play a little pass action, play action pass in there. And it's Evan Russell usually looking for Kellen McCray based off of the film that I saw. Um, you know, up front, you know, you have Alex Van Aken and Matt Cummings. Uh, on the offensive line, and then Jonas Schnagel is at nose guard, and likewise, uh, Van Aken plays linebacker and Cummings on the defensive line. So there's a couple guys for Orangeville to pay attention to, but really looking at a lot of things, Hankins and Grice really stood out a lot to me in their run game. What It's almost like it's a Mr. Inside, Mr. Outside type of deal. You know, Hankins gets the ball up the gut, Grice goes off tackle or on buck sweep. So um, basically, it's you got to play key defense. Play your keys, stay at home, and win that line, line battle. So you've obviously you just mentioned you've seen some play. Who are you taking this week? Um, I do like Orangeville in this game. I think Orangeville has the size advantage up front to be able to make things happen and bring home a W. And I think if they do that, it's going to surprise a lot of people. Knoxville is ranked in Class 2A to start the year. And at 2-2, two and two, um, I like the Broncos still. Our first South matchup of the night takes us over to Milledgeville High School, 7 p.m. on Friday, and the Milledgeville Missiles will be taking on the Amboy Clippers. Amboy comes in with a 1-2 and two mark, Milledgeville at 3-1. and one. Last week, Amboy got their first win, beating West Carroll 16-8, to eight, and Milledgeville uh, pulled out another win, uh, beating EPC 22-12. to 12. Last year, Amboy won this game 25-8 to eight in Week 8. Amboy fought out a tough win last week. What do they need to do to neutralize Milledgeville and set them up with an opportunity for a win? You know, it's almost becoming a cliche, but with Amboy's offense, once again, you got to be able to win that line battle. If you can win that line battle, you can get your running backs in Joe Quest and uh, Sean Fitzpatrick moving. Um, and Amboy needs those two guys to be able to have success. Quest is going to do the dives up the middle, and they're going to run Fitzpatrick heavily off tackle and on sweeps. Um, and, um, you know, one of the things that they have to be able to do as well is uh, get Lane Bailey in – the passing game to somewhat be effective to offset that because Milledgeville is going to hone in on those running backs and they're going to try very hard to shut that down. And the way that they've been playing, especially with Damon Miller and Ryan Kendall flying all over the field and even the improved play of Daniel Lonis, um, these guys are really starting to uh, stick out. Um, Blake Sherman's even starting to come up big. Ashton Nobis has come up big for the missiles. So the Clippers need to really get some of these guys going. Um, unfortunately, they're without Preston Hankel, which is a big loss for the Clipper offense and defense. But, um, you know, if they can get Hockstetter and Wakarius playing big up front, maybe they can make some things happen. The Milledgeville missiles continue to surprise people along the state. How do they keep it up in? their win for this week? Well, you know, the Missiles just got to keep doing what they're doing. Fly on defense and then, you know, keep doing the unthinkable on offense. I mean, we've seen them do halfback option passes. We've seen them do uh, little lob passes over the middle that haven't been expected. You just got to keep doing that mix of what they have going on. Keep feeding Damon Miller up the middle Keep running, uh, Kendall on the on the uh, leads and uh, sweeps and um, you know I think if as long as Millersville can do that, they're going to be very effective. Defensively, 
you know, Milledgeville does a very good job of turning their defense into offense, where they can provide a lot of pr- uh, pressure, force turnovers, and set themselves up with good field position. As long as they can continue doing that, that's going to lead to another W for the Missiles. Where are you taking this week? I like Milledgeville in this game. You know, like you said, you know, they're starting to surprise a lot of teams in the state. They're at 3-1. and one. They're starting to get even the coaches – uh, are looking at them at rankings. Our rankings have them coming up. The Max Preps rating system has them coming up. Um, the Missiles are doing a lot, and uh, they definitely are a big surprise to a lot of people, and they're getting noticed. And uh, I think that continues this week. I also have Millish for this week. Our next South matchup takes us to Clinton, Iowa. And there we'll be seeing the Rockford Christian Royal Lions facing the West Carroll Thunder. Yeah, it should be an interesting matchup here. We have uh, two teams that are 0-3 on the year, both clawing their way for their first win of the year. Obviously, our last two teams that are still playing that have not gained a win. So it's a big game for both these guys. Last week, Rockford Christian lost to Forreston 48 to 23. West Carroll lost in that nail biter to Amboy 16 to 8. And this is the first time these two teams are meeting, uh, so that throws a little bit extra on there as well. What can Rockford Christian do this week to keep the points rolling on the scoreboard? Well, obviously, we've seen Rockford Christian have a lot of success this year through the air, so they need to continue to do that. Um, their style of play, to a degree, reminds me of Dupec. Um, probably where Dupec was probably a year ago or two years ago. But, you know, same style of play, obviously. Um, not up to the level of par of the Rivermen yet. So what they need to do is they just they need to continue doing exactly what they're doing. Get the ball to Isaiah Johnson. Get the ball to uh, Gage Weeby. Try to get that running game going with Noah Ross, and uh, you got to get those you got to get those guys up front going. Uh, you know, Hunter Lapp, Logan Huffman, those guys got to start making some plays happen on the line for Rockford Christian to have more success. Obviously, they they can put points on the board, but they can't put them up consistently to stay in the contest with some of the teams that they have put on their schedule thus far. The Thunder have played some really tough games, and they've played hard. How can they slow down the pass of Rockford Christian? Well, you gotta you got to get a ball control offense going. Um, obviously, when you're going up against a passing offense, one of the biggest things is, one, you want incomplete passes. But, two, when you're on offense, you want to chew up that clock. Um, the longer you can keep chewing up that clock and driving down the field, the better chance you have of staying in the game. I think in this game, Rockford Christian has the advantage. So if I'm West Carroll, I want to plan my game to be able to run the ball, and I want to look for – I don't need the home run play. I just need consistent three, four, five-yard gains and keep grinding out the clock and grinding my way down the field. And as long as we can do that without making mistakes, without having turnovers – we can see some success out of the Thunder. Where are you taking? Um, I like the Royal Lions in this game. I think that their passing offense is going to be more than what West Carroll is equipped to handle at the moment. Um, and like I said, Rockford Christian does their pass game just a little bit differently than what we've seen from other pass teams. You know, they're not looking to throw it deep. They will if they catch you sleeping, but they're looking for just that five-yard out route. They just want quick completions, and if they get those yak yards, then they get them. If they don't, they're just going to keep going five yards, five yards, five yards, and keep working their way down the field. And that's why you see Norquist's numbers are so consistent over the year. And that's why I like Rockford Christian in this game. You? I also have Rockford Christian in this game. Our last South matchup of the night takes us over at Forreston High School, 7 p.m. on Friday night, and the Forreston Cardinals will be taking on the Aquin Bulldogs. 
Yeah, Aquin comes in with the highly anticipated 4 and 0 record and Forreston comes in at 2 and 1. Uh last week Aquin beat East Dubuque 40 to 12 where Forreston beat Rockford Christian 48 to 23. Last year this was an exciting matchup that saw Aquin come out in top out on top 36 to 30 in week 8 which was pretty much the clinching of the South Division Conference title for the Bulldogs in that 2019 season. How can the Bulldogs keep the offense going consistently throughout the first half? I mean, it's no secret that they only get stronger as the game goes on. You know, it's one of those things we talked about last week and the week before, and Aquin does need to have a little bit better focus in the first half to stay consistent. One of the things that we saw last week um, against East Dubuque is early in the game, they were ineffective throwing the ball. The slant routes weren't close. East Dubuque did a good job of uh, shutting off the middle of the field. Uh, the deep routes, while some of the deep routes were there, the throws weren't consistently there to make the deep route effective. Um, in the second half, you saw Aquin make the proper adjustments, which they're one of the teams that has the ability to do so. And they got more involved with Gustafson and Stiekel and kind of just took more of a ground and pound attack. And they rushed for 352 yards last week. Uh, so they, if they can make those adjustments a little bit sooner when things aren't going right in one aspect of the game, change it up to your next aspect of the game. Sooner, you might see you might see them get going a little bit quicker. But overall, obviously, Aquin is very tough, very good, and able to make adjustments rather effectively. On the note of adjustments, you know, you kind of talk about their switching, converting from you know pass to rush, whatever. How can Forreston neutralize Aquin's rush and catch them out of position? You know, when you take a look at Aquin, their line's not too big. They got Two big guys in um, Hayden Neuendorf and Kay Geiken. But outside of that, their other guys aren't very big, but they are athletic. And um, with that, you know, Forreston has a decent-sized line that can match up fairly well with what Aquin's going to have. It's going to come down to the team speed. And right now, after watching both these teams play through the well, Forreston through three weeks and Aquin through four weeks. Aquin definitely has the advantage as far as team speed. But as we've seen over the last two weeks, Jordan Neuschwander has put up back-to-back 200-plus -back yard games. We just saw that prior out of Ty Stiekel. And even last week, even though he didn't put up 200 yards, he still ran for 150. Um, I think what they need to do is Forreston needs to stick with what they do. Get the ball to Shelton up the middle get Jordan on the outside, and then your your platoon of backs there coming in, you just got to stay consistent and effective. And I think one of the advantages that can help Forreston is stick to that no-huddle offense early on to try to wear the Bulldogs down. If they can do that while keeping their energy up and have success with it, they'll be all right. One of the key areas for Forreston, though, is penalties. They've been penalized quite a bit here in the first half of the season. they got to clean that up here this week uh, in order to have a chance to beat Aquin. Just like Dupac, Aquin's putting up the numbers in a lot of areas like we talked about. I'm going to take Aquin this week. Who do you have? I like the Bulldogs, too. I think that it's th this is their year, and it's a shame that we don't get to see the playoffs we knew that this was going to be the year that they had to get things done. Right now they're proving to get it done, and I like the dogs. Well, our game of the week takes us to the Lena Winslow Athletic Bowl. Lena Winslow, 7 p.m. on Friday, and it will feature the Galena Pirates taking on the Lena Winslow Panthers. You know, it's great to see this game get moved from Freeport to Lena, and um, I'm excited for it. Obviously, Galena well, comes in. I have never heard you say you're excited about going to a game at Lena Winslow. You're right. <laughs> okay, go on. But I am excited to see Lena Winslow back at home at the Lee Wynn Athletic Bowl, where they should be. 
Uh, while I don't always like going to games there, I do enjoy the atmosphere there. It's always fun. But in this game, obviously, Galena's 4-0. Lena Winslow at 2-1. Last week, Galena beat Stockton 14-6. Lena Winslow did not play due to Dakota canceling the season last minute um, due to a COVID issue. And Lena Winslow was not able to pick up an opponent, unfortunately. Last year saw Lena Winslow win this game 46 to 7 in week 8, which was 46 to nothing at halftime. Um, obviously, big game. And the biggest question is will Galena be able to overcome what Lena Winslow is? You've been, well, at least around me, you've noted that Galena is like a Cinderella story this year for the spring season. How do they handle their toughest opponent state? Yeah, I mean, it's not a total surprise that Glean is at 4-0, but we didn't really expect them to be at 4-0 at this point. Um, obviously, it's great to see Galena back at the top. You have one of the most storied programs in conference history going up against one of the most recent storied programs in conference history. And... Um, you know, Lena Winslow is obviously definitely climbing that list, and they're right on the tails of Galena as far as that conference lore goes. And that's what really has me excited about this football game. Uh, but, you know, it's still Lena Winslow. And despite some injuries that Lena Winslow has faced and the adversity that they have, they're still a very formidable team up front. And when you are formidable up front, you can put my grandma in the backfield and they're still going to make her look like an all-star. And that's what Lena Winslow does. So, Galena is going to have to <laughs> neutralize that line play. I know. But, you know, Galena's going to have to bring that line play and offset what Lena Winslow can bring up front for Galena to have success on both sides of the ball. We already talked about Lewin had the week off, unfortunately. Um, how do you think the extra rest has helped them, and what do they need to do to get that W this week? Well, I think one of the things they'll do is it puts more focus on game prepping for uh, Galena, and when you give Coach Aaron and Milder and Benson more time to game plan, they become more impossible to beat, and we've seen that over the last 20 years. Um and it continues to grow, mind that. But um, I think what uh, the Panthers will have is a little bit more hunger right now because they did have a week off. They're getting back on the field, and now they have a game that is, let's face it, it's not a game that they know that they're going to go in and win. This is a game that's, hey, we got to be ready for these guys. They're undefeated. They're coming to our house, and we're playing in our house. Mm -hmm. How do we not let them get away with a victory? And, uh, you know, the Panthers just got to come out and execute. It's what it comes down to for them. Who are you taking this week? <sighs> well, it would be cool to see the Cinderella story keep going. And it's awesome to see Galena at 4-0. I like the black and gold. Well, that gives you a look at what we're looking forward as we move into week five. And, man, Carrie, it's flying by. We knew it would, but here we are. Week five is here, and we only got one week left. It's crazy. But I will tell you, I don't know, this is my personal note, I will take the fall over spring because allergies suck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've been having a hard time here this past week with the change in so temperature. So I, I feel for these kids. Hopefully none of them, you know. I have allergies they're dealing with, but yes, it's been an interesting season thus far. We've seen a lot of people um, that we didn't expect on top and just a lot of intermixing of things. Um, to say that it's, it hasn't been an exciting season would be completely wrong. Yeah, it's it's been full of excitement. Obviously, you know, talking to several different coaches, a lot of them feel the exact same way. We don't have much to play for. Let's go break down records. And we have some of these guys that are sitting here chomping at the bit. Mm -hmm. And they're climbing those ranks. And that's it's always exciting when you start to see 
players begin to get into that top 20 list of all-time conference players. I don't know about you. I mean, on that note, it's more exciting, too, when you see people like Hunter Hoffman, who aren't seniors this year. You know, so look, let's, to see what they've done with the six-game season, to see what they're going to do in the fall, just, I don't know, that makes the fall that much more exciting. Too. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, thinking about that, you know, it's four games in, and he's already got over a 1,000 yards passing. And if you hit through him, if you if you basically doubled that to game eight, mm-hmm. that's over two thousand yards. And realistically, depending on how his output is, mm-hmm. he could easily have a three thousand yard season in a full season this year. And like you said, it gives you a lot to look forward to this fall. Obviously, it'll be fun to watch what he does over the next two games. Um, you know. Um, Will Gustafson is six mm-hmm. touchdowns, yeah, six touchdowns away from setting the all-time uh, conference touchdown mark, uh, total offensive touchdowns, that is. Um, so that's even impressive. That's awesome in, its, in and of itself. Um, it would be cool to see him get that, you know, and just one way, you know, one one more big Aquin you know, record before they bow out to go to eight, man. Yeah, and, and, you know, you take a look at what his career has been. He's already in the top 20 in both in rushing and passing. Which is impressive. It is impressive because we haven't seen a dual-threat quarterback like that in our conference's history. I mean, you can arguably say he is the best dual-threat athlete we have ever seen. Hands down. And he's proven it week in, week out, and it's awesome. But we got some – Good games once again here in week five. Uh, good matchups. Obviously, that Aquin Forsen game is going to be a big one for people to look at. Galena and Lena Winslow, our game of the week is definitely the feature. Uh, Rockford Christian, West Carroll, bowing to get that first victory. Um, EPC and Dupac, you got a battle of crossover teams that played to an exciting finish last year. Can that uh, hold out? Stockton and uh, East Dubuque is another great one as well. You know, which team's going to get to two and three here? Uh, both teams have a lot of fight in them. And even the Orangeville and Knoxville game is going to be a showcase type game. Um, so, you know, obviously, if you can get to the games, get to the games. If you can't, get on and watch them. Uh, you know, all these teams have the links on NFHS. And we try to provide you the links when they're uh, when they are provided to us, so you can watch as well. Uh, another thing to do is always check their YouTube's. Uh, some of them already have YouTube channels created. Check them out. But as always, root for the NUIC.